before studying this module, we should be thorough with the Modigliani-Miller Proposition 1 and Proposition 2 and how the two propositions work in the absence of taxes. After studying this module, we shall be able to highlight the difference between Modigliani-Miller approach of without taxes and Modigliani-Miller approach including corporate taxes. Focus on the interest tax shield, advantage of debt as well as its disadvantage in terms of cost of financial distress. Show how the value of a firm increases with increase in leverage in the presence of corporate taxes. Analyze the various criticisms of MM approach with including corporate taxes. As you would know, amongst the various financial decisions, one of the decisions is the financing decision. The financing decision involves the choice of raising from the market, from the financial markets, two sources of funds. One could be in the form of debt and the other could be in the form of equity. Therefore, the proportion in which the financial manager decides to raise funds from the market that is as between debt and equity is known as the financing decision. The capital structure is defined in terms of the ratio of debt and equity that a firm wishes to hold. Therefore, it is important to understand what are the implications of the capital structure, the debt equity ratio as is it is known popularly and for this there are various theories. As you would recall, one of the theories is known as the MM theory. Now, we are now discussing the MM hypothesis with corporate taxes. And as you are aware, MM theory is basically a theory of irrelevance. Therefore, we want to see what is the relevance of capital structure in terms of corporate finance. This theory was first developed by Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller in a famous seminal paper in 1961. The authors claim that neither the price of the firm that is the price of shares nor its cost of capital are affected by the capital structure. According to MM theory, only the firm's ability to earn money and the riskiness of its activity can have an impact on the value of shares, the price of shares or which is the same thing as saying the value of the company. You would be aware that the value of the firm is nothing but the price of shares multiplied by the total shares that a firm has in its stock. Uh, therefore, the question that Modigliani and Miller are asking is what is the relevance of the capital structure for the value of the firm? Does the capital structure actually affect the value of the firm? Therefore, let us now look at this theory from the point of view of capital structure theories or which is also known as capital theory. Okay. 
Uh, originally in 1950s, the MM theory advocated the capital structure theory as a irrelevance theory. This suggests that the valuation of a firm is irrelevant with respect to the capital structure of a company. Whether a firm is highly leveraged or it has a lower debt component has no bearing on its market value. As we have been saying, the capital structure is defined in terms of the debt equity ratio. A high, highly leveraged firm implies that it has got a high proportion of debt in comparison to equity which is a consequence of the financing decision. So, rather than the market value of the firm being related to the capital structure, MM theory in fact says that the market value of the firm is independent of the capital structure and it only depends upon the operating profits of the company. The capital structure of the firm is a way in which the firm finances its assets. The process of growth of a company, of a firm takes place only through increasing its finance. The question that is always present before the finance manager as a financing decision is as to whether for building up the assets of the firm, for building up the capital stock of the firm, whether the firm should actually seek more of debt or whether it should seek more of equity. So, this is the basic question. Now, in this respect, the company can finance its operations uh, either by debt or by equity, but more often than not, it is done as a combination of the two. Of course, sometimes it has been seen that there are some zero debt companies as well, but this is a unusual situation. Normally, a company would be having some mixture, some proportion of debt and equity and as the debt increases, we call such a firm a leveraged firm. So, the capital structure of a firm can have a majority of debt component or a majority of equity component. Only one of the two components that is also possible as I have just mentioned or an equal mixture of the two that is of debt and equity. If it has a mixture, equal mixture of debt and equity, then its leverage ratio, the debt equity ratio would be equal to 1. But this generally does not happen. Generally, we find that the debt equity ratio would be around 2 and it could even go up to 4. Each approach has got its own advantages and disadvantages. That is, before deciding the capital structure of a firm, the financial manager has to carefully consider what are the merits and demerits of each of the sources of finance. There are various types of capital structure theories trying to establish a relationship between financial leverage of the company, the proportion of debt that is held in the capital structure with the market value of the firm. One such approach is known as the MM theory or the MM approach, the Mod Modigliani and Miller approach. Now, let us consider this MM approach for the capital structure in the light of the presence of corporate tax. The approach was developed by 
Modigliani and Miller during 1950s. The fundamentals of the MM approach resembles the net operating income approach. The MM theory advocates that the capital structure theory is a theory of irrelevance which means capital structure has no impact effectively on the firm particularly on the value of the firm. This suggests that the valuation of the firm is irrelevant to the capital structure of the company. Whether a firm is highly leveraged that means it has a high proportion of debt or it has a low proportion of debt or whether it is an ideal mixture of both debt and equity has no bearing on the share price and consequently on the value of the firm because we know that the price of share the shares multiplied by the number of shares is equal to the value of the firm. Modigliani and Miller approach further states that the market value of the firm is affected by the future growth prospect apart from the risk involved in the investment. The theory states that the value of the firm is not dependent on the choice of capital structure or the financing decision of the firm. If a company has a high growth prospect, its market value is higher. Hence, the stock price would also be higher. If the investors do not uh, set attractive growth prospects in their own estimates for the firm, then the market value of the firm would not grow at a rapid pace. Therefore, it depends upon how the investors, prospective or present investors perceive the growth prospect of the firm. Obviously, if there is a firm which is making high profits, only then the firm can expect to grow. This is also partly due to the fact that growth of a firm needs financing and financing also comes from internal funds. Internal funds are retained profits and if the profitability of a firm is high then the potential for retained profits is high and once the potential for retained profits is high the growth rate would be high and when the growth rate would be high then the investors would evaluate the firm well and when the firm is evaluated well then the firm's share price would also reflect this valuation by the investors or the holders of the shares of a firm. Now let us understand the assumptions of Modigliani and Miller. One, initially the assumption was that there are no taxes. The transaction cost for buying and selling securities as well as the bankruptcy cost is also taken to be zero. There is symmetry in the information. This means that the investors have uh, open and full and equal access to the information as the company itself would have and therefore the investors are permitted and shall behave rationally. That means there is full information in the market. The investors are not at a disadvantage compared to the company in terms of the investment that they possess. After this, the other assumption is that the cost of borrowing is the same for investors as well as for the company. That means that the financial markets are competitive. Further, the debt financing does not affect the company's EBIT, that is its uh, measure of profitability. Now, 
uh, Modigliani measure approach indicates that the value of a leveraged firm, a firm which has a high mix of debt in comparison to equity is the same as the value of an unleveraged firm. For instance, one that could be wholly financed by equity if the operating profits and the future prospects are the same. That is, if an investor purchases shares of a leveraged firm, it would cost him the same as buying a share of an unleveraged firm. At the outset, this seems a bit uh, unreasonable and intriguing, but let us see how this analysis of the MM approach works. It is obvious that the above assumptions are not realistic and do not hold in reality, but, but the firms and investors have to pay income tax, flotation and transportation uh, transaction costs and these costs are often quite large and significant. Further, a firm's cost of equity might be affected by the dividend policy due to taxation and transaction costs. Finally, investors rarely have access to the same information as managers. The managers are insiders, they know better about the company. Therefore, it has to be said that the MM approaches conclusion concerning the irrelevance of the uh, capital structure may actually not be found in the real world. MM hypothesis of irrelevance of capital structure mainly holds true because it assumes that the corporate taxes are absent. Thus, the levered and unlevered firms stand on the same footing, but in reality this is not the case. Firms do not have to pay corporate taxes and as we know that the interest paid on debentures is tax deductible. Hence, it becomes more profitable for a firm to have leverage as it is saves taxes and thus the value of such a firm increases. Thus, in the presence of corporate taxes, MM hypothesizes that the value of a firm increases as the leverage increases. Now we will see how proposition 1 of MM hypothesis works in the presence of corporate taxes. We know that interest payment on debt is tax deductible. Therefore, the levered firm will get a tax advantage as compared to an unlevered firm. This amount of tax advantage is called interest tax shield or tax advantage of debt. Hence, this advantage will increase the net operating income after tax of the levered firm as compared to unlevered firm. If the net operating income of levered firm is greater than unlevered firm, then the value of levered firm will also be greater than the value of unlevered firm. Let us now consider the determination of net operating income after taxes with the help of an example. Suppose there are two firms. One is a leveraged firm with rupees 5000 as debt in its capital structure and the other one is a unleveraged firm. The net operating income before taxes of both these firms is the same that is rupees 2500. But after tax income of the leveraged firm is but the after tax income of the leverage firm is greater than that of the unlevered firm by rupees 250 and accordingly let us look at the calculations. This is because of the presence of debt component in the 
capital structures. It is also clear that tax payments of the levered firm is less than the unlevered firm as the same amount that is rupees 250 which is the which is called the interest tax shield. Thus, the interest tax shield is equal to the savings in tax which is calculated by multiplying the tax rate with the interest as shown. Now we calculate the value of the firm and see the effect of corporate taxes on the value of the firm. We know that the value of the firm is calculated as the ratio of net operating income after tax and the cost of capital. Therefore, suppose the cost of equity is 12.5 percent. Hence, the value of the unlevered firm will be the net operating income divided by the cost of equity that is 1250 divided by 0 0.5. 125 which becomes equal to rupees 10,000. As we already know the levered firm has a higher operating income than the unlevered firm. Its value will also be therefore higher. Hence the value of the levered firm will be the value of the unlevered firm plus the present value of the interest tax shield. The present value of the interest tax shield is calculated by dividing the interest tax shield by the cost of debt that is rupees 250 divided by 0 0.10 which is equal to rupees 2500. Thus, the value of the levered firm will be 12,500 rupees as the sum of the value of the unlevered firm plus the present value of the interest tax shield. Let us consider the determination of net operating income after tax with the help of an example. Suppose there are two firms. One is levered firm with rupees 5,000 as debt in its capital structure and the other one is unlevered firm. The net operating income before tax of both the firms is same that is rupees 2500. But after tax income of levered firm is greater than that of unlevered firm by rupees 250 as shown in the calculations here. This is because of the presence of death component in its capital structure. It is also clear that the tax payment of levered firm is less than unlevered firm by the same amount that is rupees 250 which is interest tax shield. Thus interest tax shield is equal to savings in tax which is calculated by multiplying tax rate with interest as shown here. Let us now calculate the value of firm and see the effect of corporate taxes on the value of firm. We know that the value of a firm is calculated as a ratio of net operating income after tax and the cost of capital. Suppose that cost of equity is 12.5% hence value of unlevered firm will be net operating income divided by the cost of equity that is 1250 divided by 0 0.125 which is equal to rupees 10,000. As we already know that the levered firm has higher operating income than unlevered firm. Its value will also be higher hence the value of levered firm will be the value of unlevered firm plus the present value of interest tax shield. The present value of interest tax shield is calculated by dividing interest tax shield by cost of debt that is 250 divided by 0.1 which is equal to 2500. Thus, value of levered firm will be rupees 12,500 as the value of unlevered firm and present value of interest tax shield. It is very clear that 
the value of levered firm is greater than unlevered firm by the value of interest tax shield. We can also see that the value of levered firm will keep on increasing as the death portion in its capital structure increases and it will be maximum when death is 100%. We shall now discuss MM's Proposition 2 in the presence of corporate taxes. We have already discussed that in case of no taxes, the returns to equity holders increases as the leverage increases. In case of no tax return, the shareholders is given as shown here. However, if corporate taxes are present with increase in leverage, the risk of shareholders earnings increases as a result of which they would expect a higher rate of return. As the firms get interest tax shield, the risk of the shareholders gets reduced by this amount and their expected return is also reduced in the same proportion. Thus, their return is given as shown here. Hence, it can be concluded that in case of corporate taxes, also shareholders return increase on increase in leverage, but this increase is lesser as compared to the case when there are no corporate taxes. The MM hypothesis proposes that in the presence of corporate taxes, the value of firm increases with increase in leverage. But it is criticized for its practical application. In practice, firms do not employ very high level of debts and lenders also do not lend the money beyond the limit. Therefore, the debt proportion never becomes 100%, but firms do choose an optimal level of debt because of the two reasons. The first reason is personal taxes. As the debt increases, the savings of corporate taxes also increases. At the same time, the amount of personal taxes to be paid also increases. Thus, the liability of personal taxes offsets the advantage of corporate taxes. Second reason is the increase in the financial risk of the firm. The cost of financial distress also increases, which again offsets the advantage of corporate tax savings. Let us now sum up what we have learnt in this module. Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller in their famous paper developed by them approached a, the topic of capital theory and came up with a new theory. They advocated that capital structure which is the debt equity ratio is a theory of irrelevance. The capital structure of a company has no impact on the value of the share or cost of capital and on the value of the firm. This is known as the irrelevance theory of MM approach in respect of capital structure. There are many theories and there are there could be many types of different capital structures. There could be a certain capital structure which has got a very low debt component which is a unlevered firm or there could be a capital structure which has got a very high debt component and hence it is called a levered firm. So therefore, the point to be noted is that neither equity nor debt by itself is the ideal source of financing. Each source of finance has got its own advantages and disadvantages. There is a concept called interest tax shield which is equal to the savings in taxes and this could be calculated by multiplying the tax rate with the interest. And this concept has been used by the MM approach while explaining the capital structure theory. The interest tax shield as we have said is equal to the saving in tax which is calculated by multiplying the tax rate with the interest and they 
fundamental theory of the mm approach is very similar to the net operating income approach the mm approach further states that the market value of the firm is affected by the future growth prospect of the firm apart from the risk involvement in the in its investment the theory the mm theory states that the value of the firm is not dependent on the choice of the capital structure or the financing decision of the firm there are certain assumptions of the mm approach the, these are that there is there are no taxes no transaction costs for the buying and selling of securities as well also that there is no bankruptcy cost there is an symmetry in the availability of information that means there is no asymmetric information and this means that both investors as well as companies have equal access to information both in terms of quality and quantity of information the cost of borrowing is also the same both for investors as well as the companies this means that the financial markets are highly competitive open and there is no information asymmetry debt financing therefore they believe does not affect the company's ebit the assumptions that have been made by the mm hypothesis are not realistic and do not hold good in reality both firms and investors have to pay income tax there is flotation cost and transaction cost which are quite significant further the firm's cost of equity might be affected by the dividend policy due to taxation and due to transaction cost on such unrealistic assumptions the mm hypothesis states that there is initially they believed that there there would be no corporate taxes when corporate taxes exist then firms can increase earnings of the investors through borrowing which results in a interest tax shield the value of the perpetual interest tax shield which is pb i n t s is equal to the tax rate into the debt burden that is the interest uh, the market value of the levered firm will be equal to the market value of the unlevered firm plus the present value of the interest tax shield this can be given as vl which is the value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm vu plus t multiplied by d the above equation implies that firms can continuously increase its value by borrowing more of debt thus a firm should actually have 100% debt by this count in their capital structure so therefore in this sense once taxes are accounted for we really cannot talk about the irrelevance but there is a relationship between levered firms and unlevered levered firms which is through this tax shield in practice we may not find firms employing high amounts of debt the reason is that this could be personal taxes and another reason is that this could lead to financial distress in uh, an extreme situation therefore the point to be noted is that according to this theory 
the, the tax that is relevant over here is the corporate tax. In the case of corporate taxes, shareholders returns also increase with the increase in leverage, but this increase is lesser as the compensated to the case as compared to the case when there are no corporate taxes. Obviously, taxes take away a part of the profit. The criticism of the MM approach is that as debt increases, the savings of corporate taxes also increase, but at the same time the amount of personal taxes to be paid also increase. That thus those who criticize the MM approach state that the liability of personal taxes offsets the advantage due to an increase in the corporate taxes. Secondly, the greater amount, the amount of the debt, it would also lead to a greater financial risk of the firm. Thus, the cost of financial distress also increases which again offsets the advantage due to an increase in the corporate tax savings.